Good evening and welcome to Special Assignment. I'm your host, Ashraf Garda. Today, on the 95th birthday of former President Nelson Mandela, people around the globe have been doing good deeds for 67 minutes. We're all inspired by the service to humanity displayed by Madiba. But what is often overlooked is that Mandela also displayed compassion to animals. And he has served as a patron of the animal rights organization, the NSPCA. So tonight we put the spotlight on the plight of the king of beasts. The cruel practice of canned lion hunting in South Africa was exposed in 1997. And for a while it seemed like the practice had been stopped. However, recent video footage of a lion hunt has again raised questions about whether the king of beasts is being exploited. Producer Rochelle Seaton Rogers investigates. Canned lion hunting was exposed back in 1997, but how much has changed in 16 years? Is the king of beasts being exploited? People farm with lions as with sheep, with goats, with game, with kudu, with sable, with buffalo, to make money. But this practice has activists up in arms. We're breeding very beautiful, very intelligent, very long-lived social animals like battery chickens um, as a product for a hunt. Are the cute lion cubs, which people flock to cuddle and photograph, bred just to die? The life of a captive bred lion in South Africa is one completely without dignity, ending up at the end of the day with a, with a bullet. And do international volunteers forking out thousands to raise lion cubs know that they're possibly part of a multi-million rand scam? I started doing some research and that was when I realised, you know what, this is not what it's, it's said to be. South Africa has been blessed with arguably the best variety of wildlife in the world. And at the top of the food chain is the king of beasts, the lion. It was in 1997 that the can of worms, which is canned lion hunting, was opened. Recently a video that was posted on YouTube of what is said to be a tame lioness being hunted in a so-called canned hunt made news reports and caused shock and horror that this practice is still happening. Here a lioness runs alongside the car in what appears to be a playful way. She doesn't appear to be scared of the car or the people in it. She appears to have nowhere to escape to and looks like she doesn't think she needs to, most likely because she's been around humans her whole life. She is then shot with an arrow and her body writhes in pain as she dies. It once again begs the question, is canned hunting still taking place in South Africa? This hunt is considered illegal for a number of reasons and the hunter has since been charged. Professor Porchita from the Predators Breeders Association explains why. In the first place, uh, you may not uh, shoot a lion with a bow and arrow in the free state. You may not shoot it uh, at a close, uh, a close uh, environment. And my interpretation of what I saw is that it was a fairly small enclosure. You may not shoot from a vehicle. And that was done also. For me and the rest of the public, it looked like a canned hunt. Chris Mercer is the director of the campaign against canned hunting and has been campaigning tirelessly for over a decade to stop it. Canned lion hunting is where the target animal is prevented unfairly from escaping the hunter, uh, either by physical constraints such as fencing uh, or by mental constraints such as being habituated to humans. Karen Trendler from Working Wild also gives us a definition. There are various ways that they carry out the canned hunt um, and all of it is basically guaranteeing that when the hunter arrives on site there will be a lion for him to shoot. It might be releasing the animal from a cage into a very, very small camp the night before the hunt. The animal may be drugged so that he is in a certain position and doesn't move and they can be sure he's there. Or they put out baits for the animal so that he is drawn to a particular area and has no other option and has to, to be there when the hunt takes place. But the definition of canned hunting is somewhat different when we ask the Predator Breeders Association and the Professional Hunters Association. The term canned hunting is a term that um, 
we, we do not like to use. It was a term that was coined 10, 12 years back uh, following the so-called Cook Report. But since then, everything has changed with regard to lion hunting. I need to differentiate very clearly between canned lion hunting and captive bred lion hunting. It's because canned lion hunting is an illegal activity. It's against legislation. Um, as far as FASA is concerned, it's totally against our code of conduct. So is canned hunting still taking place in South Africa? Virtually all can, uh, hunting in South Africa is canned hunting to a greater or lesser degree. Uh, all trophy hunting takes place in fenced camps of smaller or larger extent. This is not Tanzania where you can walk for a week without crossing a fence. This is a developed country and consequently virtually all trophy hunting is canned hunting and it's perfectly legal in South Africa. Lions has been bred in captivity specifically to be hunted. Um, there's a demand for it. Once again, it's, it's sustainable. It's definitely taken off the pressure on the, on the hunting of the wild lions. It's a business. Special Assignment came across a video which is distributed to promote hunting. Corin says she believes this is a canned hunt where the lion has been drugged. A wild lion or a lion that is undrugged will be very alert, will be very aware, especially the proximity that the hunters, the sound of the vehicles, the sound of people, the smell of them, even if he hasn't been able to see them. He will be very alert and he will be very active. With a drugged animal, um, and in particular the footage we saw, there was absolutely no response. The animal wasn't responding naturally to its environment. And when the first shot went off, there was also very, very little reaction from that animal. And you're only going to get that with an animal that is drugged. Do you know what is the green con? Are international tours being conned? We find out after this. The Department of Environmental Affairs says that South Africa has over 170 breeding farms. Tourists, local and abroad, flock to these places to pay to play with baby lions. We googled places to go and play with baby cubs, but on the first page of hits, three warnings came up telling people not to play with lion cubs. We visit the sites. They say that lion cub petting is a conservation con and that the cubs are just being pimped for money and will most likely end up in a hunt. They pull cubs from the mother anything between three days and ten days. Not only does this bring her into oestrus again so that she cycles and she can have more cubs, but it ensures a ready supply of young cubs that paying volunteers and tourists can come in and play with and pet and touch. In the case of, of females, they, they're used for breeding and they, instead of breeding once every two years as they would in the wild, sometimes it's up to three times in a year, which is completely unnatural. Physically it's exhausting and, and at the end of the day she sold off for a cheap hunt. I hope that anyone watching this program will never ever visit any uh, facility that allows cub petting because they are s directly enriching the canned hunting industry by doing so. But the Predator Breeders Association says it's trying to make sure there's no overbreeding of lions, otherwise it will drop the profits of the industry. We are worried about the lion numbers uh, and we as an association are looking forward to convince the Department of Environmental Affairs to put the moratorium on lion breeding. Lion breeding farms are also making millions by marketing to international volunteers to come and pay to hand raise lion cubs. Special assignment posed as a would-be volunteer and was given this information, which shows how much tourists can pay for such an experience, and it's not cheap. Large numbers of overseas people come and pay huge amounts to do what they believe is conserving lion or looking after some animal to put it back into the wild. And in fact they are supporting an industry where those animals are bred and obtained purely to bring in international paying volunteers. It's, it's commercial. Special Assignment tracked down some international volunteers who paid over 30,000 rand a month to hand raise lion cubs in South Africa. They asked us to protect their identities. I spoke to one of the volunteers via video chat. The experience 
description from the organization that allow you to book that uh, basically states that you're going to be a mom to lion cubs, you'll comfort them, you'll feed them, you'll do everything that their mom would do for them in the wild. So you're actually led to believe that you're doing something for conservation. And I think that's why a lot of people sign up to it. And when did you first start becoming uncomfortable about what was happening at the breeding farm? It took a few visits actually to the place before I started to see the cracks appearing. Um, my first experience, as I say, is about four years ago and was brilliant. But um, since then, I've been back a few times and I've seen changes over time that simply didn't tally with the conservation label. Did you ever ask questions about what was happening to the lion cubs once they grew too big to be hand raised or petted by human beings? Yes, we did ask a few questions, but um, very well, most of the time they just find a way to not answer it. You're never told in an outright way what is going to happen. I mean, somebody there is connected uh, through a friendship with somebody who is notorious in South Africa for supplying rights for hunts. And also, um, the son of the owner, when you start Googling him, you'll quickly find out that he was a couple of years ago convicted for involvement in a rhino poaching syndicate. This is what the other volunteer had to say about her experience. I tried a few different websites and came up with this one that was touted as a responsible um, organisation. Uh, one of the, the programmes that it promoted was the line farm where I ended up and basically it was advertised as raising lion and tiger cubs. There was no uh, reason given as to why these animals were separated from their mothers to be raised, but um, from everything that the website said, I thought it sounded like it was a, a worthwhile ethical project, so I decided to go with it. But she found out the money wasn't going to conservation as promised. There was quite a hefty payment. The travel company that I chose charged $3,000 a month. And um, I was told that a third of that went to the project, but then I found out later that they got nowhere near that. And when I saw the sorts of problems that the cubs were coming down with due to their diet, um, when I saw that there was no veterinary treatment sought for anything, and then I started hearing rumours about what, had, what involvement the owners had had with other... Uh, not quite ethical projects. It was only when I started doing my own research that I found out that there were uh, links to places that have been in the media for canned hunting. The different provinces all have different laws when it comes to captive lion breeding and hunting. In the Free State, when a captive bred lion is released into a camp to be hunted, it must be left for three months to adapt before the hunt. In the Northwest, it's four days. Hunting lion with a bow is also legal in the Northwest, but illegal in the Free State. Both national and provincial authorities are allowed to make legislation that regulate these activities. Uh, what the department tried to do through the Threatened or Protected Species regulations is to set a minimum period of release. And I'm sure you know that that ended up in a court case where the South African Predator, Breeder, Predator Breeders Association um, took the department to court to have that set aside. Based on the judgment, we are not mandated to regulate what we consider put and take, so the, 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 the period of release prior to the hunt. So basically what happened is that we fell back to, we had to fall back to the provincial legislation, which then is different between the different provinces. Conservationists and activists blame the department for allowing what they say is the exploitation of the lion for profits. I think the laws in South Africa, especially environmental legislation, is protecting lions in terms of ensuring that any activity involving a lion is done in a sustainable way to ensure the conservation. So any activity that will have an impact on the conservation of the species will be regulated in, in where and where there is a need, it will be prohibited. Breeding farms and hunting outfitters are making millions. 
cubs are being treated as playthings, lionesses as robots for breeding, and males as things to kill for trophies. Imagine this scenario. If a farm has four foreign volunteers for eight months, the time it takes for a cub to get too big for handling, the farm makes one million rand. Coming up next, lions rescued from bad captive situations. These disturbing images of so-called canned hunts are not easy to watch, but sometimes they are what push people into action, like it did for Fiona Miles. It saddens me on the one hand, but on the other hand, it, it, it really drives me to, to try and um, find other solutions and, and try and find a way to make a change for these animals. Fiona is now the operational director at the International Welfare Organization, Four Paws, in South Africa. Four Paws has been campaigning tirelessly over the last few years to see an end to cant hunting, appealing strongly to the South African government and internationally to, to see an end to, to this industry, which is basically treating lions as, as a commodity, as opposed to an, a majestic and wild animal, which it is. Four Paws, as well as other NGOs like Avaz, have created petitions for local and international people to sign to push for the South African government to put a stop to captive lion breeding and hunting. They've received hundreds of thousands of signatures given to government, but say nothing has changed. Lions Rock, Big Cat Sanctuary, was set up by Four Paws in the Free State to rescue big cats from bad conditions, including the canned hunting industry. So far, they've rescued over 90 animals. Although these animals still have to live in fenced enclosures, they have it good here, as their living conditions are very spacious and much more natural compared to those on breeding farms. Human interaction with the animals is also kept to a minimum. For the residents of this sanctuary, it's clear that their favorite time of day is feeding time. The normal food feeding routine is actually quite, quite simple. We have at each big enclosure, we have a feeding area, we call it feeding area. It's a separation area where we can uh, go safely inside, put the meat out, and then we exit again, we close the, 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 the gates, and then we open for the lions to come in and fetch their meat. These lions are not hand-raised animals. They're all rescued from different um, bad circumstances. Uh, and obviously, especially if, if, if you as a human being will go there with a piece of meat, you will not be safe. They will come for you also. So, you know, we wouldn't try that. Stories here are sad, like this family rescued from captivity in Romania, highlighting the plight of captive bred lions. Hera and Sara were rescued from uh, the Onesh Zoo in Romania two months ago by four paws. They lived together with their parents, uh, Tarzan and uh, Siba. They were also born in that zoo. Completely a tiny, I think it was six square meters in size, a very small area, concrete floors, freezing cold conditions. Um, and the zoo had to close down uh, quite some time ago for not being able to conform to the EU standards. And uh, basically the animals in that zoo were being looked after by the local local people and being fed so their story is quite quite special in the fact that of course it goes it, it goes or they can, I would say that they are ambassadors for for lion cubs all over the world that are being born into captivity but the prognosis for the cubs was not a good one the x-rays showed that um, their bone formation was completely underdeveloped and this was due to malnutrition. I believe probably since the mother had not received correct nutrition either. So it looked like their bones were literally floating in their bodies. There was nothing connecting them, no joints. So when they arrived to us, they were literally walking on their elbows. Um, after two months of being here at Lions Rock where they've received the correct nutrition on a daily basis, uh, the correct medications, uh, their wounds have completely healed. And after x-rays just a few days ago, we were so surprised and delighted to see their bones are actually forming properly now. The main issue though is, is that this is what happens to animals who are born and bred in captivity without controls and without the correct nutrition and care. This lioness still bears the scars of her past life because she has lost part of her ear. 
because of the severe cold, we've seen it with, with a number of lions, um, the ears actually suffer from frostbite and they, it, it eventually goes dead and, and those pieces fall away. The constant breeding and hunting of lions and the petting of lion cubs seems to be making big cat sanctuaries a bigger necessity. Jukani Wildlife Sanctuary in the Eastern Cape also has a forever home for them. I don't think a lot of people know the stress that a wild animal goes through when it's being petted. They get so much stress-related illnesses. They get diarrhea, they vomit. It's, it is just incredible. I believe at this stage we lose about half of the people that would have come because we said no animal petting, no breeding with our place. Um, but the people that come here, we explain to them what's going on, why we won't do the petting thing, and a lot of them, it's like a light bulb moment if they can put themselves into the animal's um, position. Since it started, the sanctuary has grown to hold 45 animals and is an educational centre. Jörg and I just couldn't believe that you can have the heart and the, and the mind to raise these beautiful creatures and then have them sold and hunted. Actually not hunted, shot, because they tame, they captive bred. Mm -hmm. So they come from one of those farms. Grompi that's walking here was six months old. His name is Grompi, which means growly. He talks a lot, we love him. And Kara over there, she's a bit more aware of people. She's been treated a bit worse than Grompi. She was eight months old when we, when we bought her. Mm -hmm. And they're both now going for seven, eight years that they've been with us. Although FASA and the Breeders' Association have defended the captive breeding and hunting industry, they've admitted there are problems, which they're trying to deal with with a newly appointed task team. The mandate of the, the task team would be to, to see if we can reach a stage where FASA and the ESA Predators' Association can put something on the table um, regarding the way that um, captive red lions will be hunted in South Africa, which will, won't be to the detriment of our country's image as far as a hunting destination is concerned, and something that could be seen as an acceptable practice. We all know that the lion in the industry until now uh, does not have a good name. And I've made it my personal mi mission to help clear that up and to create an industry of we as Africans can be proud internationally. The message from the people fighting the industry is that a live animal is worth much more than a dead one. I'd like to see a complete ban on all trophy hunting in South Africa. This is not as radical as it seems. Uh, Kenya banned uh, all sport and trophy hunting 30 years ago as a barbaric relic of colonialism, which it is, and they have a tourist industry to die for. The lion is really the, the, the icon of, of, uh, of Africa. It's a wild animal, it belongs in the wild, and one day I hope to see these fences no longer needing to exist. Now I'd like you to share your views about this issue and you can tweet, Facebook or email us. Finally, comment about last week's show on the condition of our water infrastructure and pollution. Yashika Dunarai on Facebook, prevention is better than cure. We need to become more aware of how we treat our environment because ultimately we are the ones most affected in the end. And Kanya Ngonyama tweeted, we need to maintain our sewage infrastructure while investing in water reuse technology. Well, that's it for tonight. Join us again next week when we point out the issues that matter.